Chapter Five, Part Two of Winds of Doctrine: Studies in Contemporary Opinion by George Santayana. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Chapter Five: Shelley or the Poetic Value of Revolutionary Principles, Part Two. The mind of man is not merely a sensorium. His intelligence is not merely an instrument for adaptation there is a germ within a nucleus of force and organization which can be unfolded under favourable circumstances into a perfection inwardly determined man's constitution is a fountain from which to draw an infinity of gushing music not representing anything external yet not unmeaning on that account since it represents the capacities and passions latent in him from the beginning these potentialities however are no oracles of truth being innate they are arbitrary being a priori they are subjective but they are good principles for fiction for poetry for morals for religion they are principles for the true expression of man but not for the true description of the universe when they are taken for the latter fiction becomes deception poetry illusion morals fanaticism and religion bad science the orgy of delusion into which we are then plunged comes from supposing the a priori to be capable of controlling the actual and the innate to be a standard for the true that rich and definite endowment which might have made the distinction of the poet then makes the narrowness of the philosopher so shelley with a sort of tyranny of which he does not suspect the possible cruelty would impose his ideal of love and equality upon all creatures he would make enthusiasts of clowns and doves of vultures in him as in many people too intense a need of loving excludes the capacity for intelligent sympathy his feeling cannot accommodate itself to the inequalities of human nature his good will is a geyser and will not consent to grow cool and to water the flat and vulgar reaches of life shelley is blind to the excellences of what he despises as he is blind to the impossibility of realizing what he wants his sympathies are narrow as his politics are visionary so that there is a certain moral incompetence in his moral intensity yet his abstraction from half of life or from nine-tenths of it was perhaps necessary if silence and space were to be won in his mind for its own upwelling ecstatic harmonies the world we have always with us but such spirits we have not always and the spirit has fire enough within to make a second stellar universe an instance of shelley's moral incompetence and moral intensity is to be found in his view of selfishness and evil from the point of view of pure spirit selfishness is quite absurd as a contemporary of ours has put it it is so evident that it is better to secure a greater good for a than a lesser good for b that it is hard to find any still more evident principle by which to prove this and if a happens to be someone else and b to be myself that cannot affect the question it is very foolish not to love your neighbour as yourself since his good is no less good than yours convince people of this and who can resist such perfect logic and presto all property in things has disappeared all jealousy in love and all rivalry in honour how happy and secure every one will suddenly be and how much richer than in our mean blind competitive society the single word love and we have just seen that love is a logical necessity offers an easy and final solution to all moral and political problems shelley cannot imagine why this solution is not accepted and why logic does not produce love he can only wonder and grieve that it does not and since selfishness and ill-will seem to him quite gratuitous his ire is aroused he thinks them unnatural and monstrous he could not in the least understand evil even when he did it himself all villainy seemed to him wanton all lust frigid all hatred insane all was an abomination alike that was not the lovely spirit of love now this is a very unintelligent view of evil and if shelley had had time to read spinoza an author with whom he would have found himself largely in sympathy 
he might have learned that nothing is evil in itself and that what is evil in things is not due to any accident in creation nor to groundless malice in man evil is an inevitable aspect which things put on when they are struggling to preserve themselves in the same habitat in which there is not room or matter enough for them to prosper equally side by side under these circumstances the partial success of any creature say the cancer microbe is an evil from the point of view of those other creatures say men to whom that success is a defeat shelley sometimes half perceived this inevitable tragedy so he says of the fair lady in the sensitive plant all killing insects and gnawing worms and things of obscene and unlovely forms she bore in a basket of indian wolf into the rough woods far aloof in a basket of grasses and wild flowers full the freshest her gentle hands could pull for the poor banished insects whose intent although they did ill was innocent now it is all very well to ask cancer microbes to be reasonable and go feed on oak leaves if the oak leaves do not object oak leaves might be poison for them and in any case cancer microbes cannot listen to reason they must go on propagating where they are unless they are quickly and utterly exterminated and fundamentally men are subject to the same fatality exactly they cannot listen to reason unless they are reasonable and it is unreasonable to expect that being animals they should be reasonable exclusively imagination is indeed at work in them and makes them capable of sacrificing themselves for any idea that appeals to them for their children perhaps or for their religion but they are not more capable of sacrificing themselves to what does not interest them than the cancer microbes are of sacrificing themselves to men when shelley marvels at the perversity of the world he shows his ignorance of the world the illusion he suffers from is constitutional and such as larks and sensitive plants are possibly subject to in their way what he is marvelling at is really that anything should exist at all not a creature of his own moral disposition consequently the more he misunderstands the world and bids it change its nature the more he expresses his own nature so that all is not vanity in his illusion nor night in his blindness the poet sees most clearly what his ideal is he suffers no illusion in the expression of his own soul his political utopias his belief in the power of love in his cryingly subjective and inconstant way of judging people are one side of the picture the other is his lyrical power wealth and ecstasy if he had understood universal nature he would not have so glorified in his own and his own nature was worth glorifying it was i think the purest tenderest richest most rational nature ever poured forth in verse i have not read in any language such a full expression of the unadulterated instincts of the mind the world of shelley is that which the vital monad within many of us i will not say within all for who shall set bounds to the variations of human nature the world which the vital monad within many of us i say would gladly live in if it could have its way matthew arnold said that shelley was not quite sane and certainly he was not quite sane if we place sanity and justness of external perception adaptation to matter and docility to the facts but his lack of sanity was not due to any internal corruption it was not even an internal eccentricity he was like a child like a platonic soul just fallen from the empyrean and the child may be dazed credulous and fanciful but he is not mad on the contrary his earnest playfulness the constant distraction of his attention from observation to daydreams is the sign of an inward order and fecundity appropriate to his age if children did not see visions good men would have nothing to work for it is the soul of observant persons like matthew arnold that is apt not to be quite sane and whole inwardly but somewhat warped by familiarity with the perversities of real things and forced to misrepresent its true ideal like a tree bent by too prevalent a wind half the fertility of such a soul is lost and the other half is denaturalized no doubt 
in its sturdy deformity the practical mind is an instructive and not unpleasing object an excellent if somewhat pathetic expression of the climate in which it is condemned to grow and of its dogged clinging to an ingrate soil but it is a wretched expression of its innate possibilities shelley on the contrary is like a palm tree in the desert or a star in the sky he is perfect in the midst of the void his obtuseness to things dynamic to the material order leaves his whole mind free to develop things aesthetic after their own kind his abstraction permits purity his playfulness makes room for creative freedom his ethereal quality is only humanity having its way we perhaps do ourselves an injustice when we think that the heart of us is sordid what is sordid is rather the situation that cramps or stifles the heart in itself our generative principle is surely no less fertile and generous than the generative principle of crystals or flowers as it can produce a more complex body it is capable of producing a more complex mind and the beauty and life of this mind like that of the body is all predetermined in the seed circumstances may suffer the organism to develop or prevent it from doing so they cannot change its plan without making it ugly and deformed what shelley's mind draws from the outside its fund of images is like what the germ of the body draws from the outside its food a mass of mere materials to transform and reorganize with these images shelley constructs a world determined by his native genius as the seed organizes out of its food a predetermined system of nerves and muscles shelley's poetry shows us the perfect but naked body of human happiness what clothes circumstances may compel most of us to add may be a necessary concession to climate to custom or to shame they can hardly add a new vitality or any beauty comparable to that which they hide when the soul as in shelley's case is all goodness and when the world seems all illegitimacy and obstruction we need not wonder that freedom should be regarded as a panacea even if freedom had not been the idol of shelley's times he would have made an idol of it for himself i never could discern in him says his friend hogg any more than two principles the first was a strong irrepressible love of liberty the second was an equally ardent love of toleration and an intense abhorrence of persecution we all fancy nowadays that we believe in liberty and abhor persecution but the liberty we approve of is usually only a variation in social compulsions to make them less galling to our latest sentiments than the old compulsions would be if we retained them liberty of the press and liberty to vote do not greatly help us in living after our own mind which is i suppose the only positive sort of liberty from the point of view of a poet there can be little essential freedom so long as he is forbidden to live with the people he likes and compelled to live with the people he does not like this to shelley seemed the most galling of tyrannies and free love was to his feeling the essence and test of freedom love must be spontaneous to be a spiritual bond in the beginning and it must remain spontaneous if it is to remain spiritual to be bound by one's past is as great a tyranny to pure spirit as to be bound by the sin of adam or by the laws of artaxerxes and those of us who do not believe in the possibility of free love ought to declare frankly that we do not at bottom believe in the possibility of freedom i never was attached to that great sect whose doctrine is that each one should select out of the crowd a mistress or a friend and all the rest though fair and wise commend to cold oblivion though it is the code of modern morals and the beaten road which those poor slaves with weary footsteps tread who travel to their home among the dead by the broad highway of the world and so with one chained friend perhaps a jealous foe the dreariest and the longest journey go true love in this differs from gold and clay that to divide is not to take away love is like understanding that grows bright gazing on many truths narrow the heart that loves the brain that contemplates the life that wears the spirit that creates one object in one form and builds thereby a sepulchre for its eternity 
the difficulties in reducing this charming theory of love to practice are well exemplified in shelley's own life he ran away with his first wife not because she inspired any uncontrollable passion but because she declared she was a victim of domestic oppression and threw herself upon him for protection nevertheless when he discovered that his best friend was making love to her in spite of his free love principles he was very seriously annoyed when he presently abandoned her feeling a spiritual affinity in another direction she drowned herself in the serpentine and his second wife needed all her natural sweetness and all her inherited philosophy to reconcile her to the waves of platonic enthusiasm for other ladies which periodically swept the too sensitive heart of her husband free love would not then secure freedom from complications it would not remove the present occasion for jealousy reproaches tragedies and the dragging of a lengthening chain freedom of spirit cannot be translated into freedom of action you may amend laws and customs and social entanglements but you will still have them for this world is a lumbering mechanism and not like love a plastic dream wisdom is very old and therefore often ironical and it has long taught that it is well for those who would live in the spirit to keep as clear as possible of the world and that marriage especially a free love marriage is a snare for poets let them endure to love freely hopelessly and infinitely after the manner of plato and dante and even of goethe when goethe really loved that exquisite sacrifice will improve their verse and it will not kill them let them follow in the traces of shelley when he wrote in his youth i have been most of the night pacing a churchyard i must now engage in scenes of strong interest i expect to gratify some of this insatiable feeling in poetry i slept with a loaded pistol and some poison last night but did not die happy man if he had been able to add and did not marry last among the elements of shelley's thought i may perhaps mention his atheism shelley called himself an atheist in his youth his biographers and critics usually say that he was or that he became a pantheist he was an atheist in the sense that he denied the orthodox conception of a deity who is a voluntary creator a legislator and a judge but his aversion to christianity was not founded on any sympathetic or imaginative knowledge of it and a man who preferred the paradiso of dante to almost any other poem and preferred it to the popular inferno itself could evidently be attracted by christian ideas and sentiment the moment they were presented to him as expressions of moral truth rather than as gratuitous dogmas a pantheist he was in the sense that he felt how fluid and vital this whole world is but he seems to have had no tendency to conceive any conscious plan or logical necessity connecting the different parts of the whole so that rather than a pantheist he might be called a panpsychist especially as he did not subordinate morally the individual to the cosmos he did not surrender the authority of moral ideals in the face of physical necessity which is properly the essence of pantheism he did the exact opposite so much so that the chief characteristic of his philosophy is its promethean spirit he maintained that the basis of moral authority was internal diffused among all individuals that it was the natural love of the beautiful and the good wherever it might spring and however fate might oppose it to suffer to forgive to defy power to love and bear to hope till hope creates from its own wreck the thing it contemplates neither to change nor falter nor repent this is to be good great and joyous beautiful and free shelley was also removed from any ordinary atheism by his truly speculative sense for eternity he was a thorough platonist all metaphysics perhaps is poetry but platonic metaphysics is good poetry and to this class shelley's belongs for instance the pure spirit shall flow back to the burning fountain whence it came a portion of the eternal which must glow through time and change unquenchably the same peace peace he is not dead he doth not sleep he hath awakened from the dream of life tis we who lost in stormy visions keep with phantoms an unprofitable strife 
he is made one with nature there is heard his voice in all her music from the moan of thunder to the song of night's sweet bird he is a portion of the loveliness which once he made more lovely the splendours of the firmament of time may be eclipsed but are extinguished not like stars to their appointed height they climb and death is a low mist which cannot blot the brightness it may veil when lofty thought lifts a young heart above its mortal lair the dead live there atheism or pantheism of this stamp cannot be taxed with being gross or materialistic the trouble is rather that it is too hazy in its sublimity the poet has not perceived the natural relation between facts and ideals so clearly or correctly as he has felt the moral relation between them but his allegiance to the intuition which defies for the sake of felt excellence every form of idolatry or cowardice wearing the mask of religion this allegiance is itself the purest religion and it is capable of inspiring the sweetest and most absolute poetry in daring to lay bare the truths of fate the poet creates for himself the subtlest and most heroic harmonies and he is comforted for the illusions he has lost by being made incapable of desiring them we have seen that shelley being unteachable could never put together any just idea of the world he merely collected images and emotions and out of them made worlds of his own his poetry accordingly does not well express history nor human character nor the constitution of nature what he enrolls before us instead is in a sense fantastic it is a series of landscapes passions and cataclysms such as never were on earth and never will be if you are seriously interested only in what belongs to earth you will not be seriously interested in shelley literature according to matthew arnold should be criticism of life and shelley did not criticize life so that his poetry had no solidity but is life we may ask the same thing as the circumstances of life on earth is the spirit of life that marks and judges those circumstances itself nothing music is surely no description of the circumstances of life yet it is relevant to life unmistakably for it stimulates by means of a torrent of abstract movements and images the formal and emotional possibilities of living which lie in the spirit by so doing music becomes a part of life a congruous addition a parallel life as it were to the vulgar one i see no reason in the analogies of the natural world for supposing that the circumstances of human life are the only circumstances in which the spirit of life can disport itself even on this planet there are sea animals and air animals ephemeral beings and self-centred beings as well as persons who can grow as old as matthew arnold and be as fond as he was of classifying other people and beyond this planet and in the interstices of what our limited senses can perceive there are probably many forms of life not criticized in any of the books which matthew arnold said we should read in order to know the best that has been thought and said in the world the future too even among men may contain as shelley puts it many arts though unimagined yet to be the divination of poets cannot of course be expected to reveal any of these hidden regions as they actually exist or will exist but what would be the advantage of revealing them it could only be what the advantage of criticizing human life would be also to improve subsequent life indirectly by turning it towards attainable goods and is it not as important a thing to improve life directly and in the present if one has the gift by enriching rather than criticizing it besides there is need of fixing the ideal by which criticism is to be guided if you have no image of happiness or beauty or perfect goodness before you how are you to judge what portions of life are important and what rendering of them is appropriate being a singer inwardly inspired shelley could picture the ideal goals of life the ultimate joys of experience better than a discursive critic or observer could have done the circumstances of life are only the bases or instruments of life the fruition of life is not in retrospect nor in description of the instruments but in expression of the spirit itself to which those instruments may prove useful as music is not a criticism of violins but a playing upon them this expression need not resemble its ground 
experience is diversified by colors that are not produced by colors sounds that are not conditioned by sounds names that are not symbols for other names fixed ideal objects that stand for ever-changing material processes the mind is fundamentally lyrical inventive redundant its visions are its own offspring hatched in the warmth of some favourable cosmic gale the ambient weather may vary and these visions be scattered but the ideal world they pictured may some day be revealed again to some other poet similarly inspired the possibility of restoring it or something like it is perpetual it is precisely because shelley's sense for things is so fluid so elusive that it opens to us emotionally what is a serious scientific probability namely that human life is not all life nor the landscape of earth the only admired landscape in the universe that the ancients who believed in gods and spirits were nearer the virtual truth however anthropomorphically they may have expressed themselves than any philosophy or religion that makes human affairs the centre and aim of the world such moral imagination is to be gained by sinking into oneself rather than by observing remote happenings because it is at its heart not at its fingertips that the human soul touches matter and is akin to whatever other centres of life may people the infinite for this reason the masters of spontaneity the prophets the inspired poets the saints the mystics the musicians are welcome and most appealing companions in their simplicity and abstraction from the world they come very near the heart they say little and help much they do not picture life but have life and give it so we may say i think of shelley's magic universe what he said of greece if it must be a wreck yet shall its fragments reassemble and build themselves again impregnably in a diviner clime to amphionic music on some cape sublime which frowns above the idle foam of time frowns says shelley rhetorically as if he thought that something timeless something merely ideal could be formidable or could threaten existing things with any but an ideal defeat tremendous error eternal possibilities may indeed beckon they may attract those who instinctively pursue them as a star may guide those who wish to reach the place over which it happens to shine but an eternal possibility has no material power it is only one of an infinity of other things equally possible intrinsically yet most of them quite unrealizable in this world of blood and mire the realm of eternal essences rains down no jovian thunderbolt but only a ghostly uranian calm there is no frown there rather a passive and universal welcome to any who may have in them the will and the power to climb whether any one has the will depends on his material constitution and whether he has the power depends on the firm texture of that constitution and on circumstances happening to be favourable to its operation otherwise what the rebel or the visionary hails as his ideal will be no picture of his destiny or of that of the world it will be and will always remain merely a picture of his heart this picture indestructible in its ideal essence will mirror also the hearts of those who may share or may have shared the nature of the poet who drew it so purely ideal and so deeply human are the visions of shelley so truly does he deserve the epitaph which a clear-sighted friend wrote upon his tomb cor cordium the heart of hearts end of chapter five recording by expatriate in bangor maine